I finally got my CPA, my certified public accountant, to sit down and let me interview her. So we're going to hear what a real estate accountant has to say about taxes. Let's go. Hey class, Chris Haskins here with TheRealEstateRoundup.com where my mission statement, my ministry is to raise your financial literacy through real estate investing and entrepreneurship today. Got a great flip tip for you, as I hopefully I always do. I try, I try to, I put forth my best effort to serve you. Thank you for letting me serve. I'm gonna bring you into my world. I finally convinced my accountant, my CPA, to sit down with me and do an interview. Now, now, not everybody wants to have their life blasted all over the internet. And my accountant is one of those people. She doesn't want to have any pictures or any of anything on the internet of her. So it took me actually years to convince her to sit down with me and allow me to interview her with one condition class. I didn't bring in any video. So you're gonna hear this interview. You won't see her, but you'll hear the interview. I'm gonna ask her questions about taxes, deductions, capital gains, write-offs, <coughs> all that crap, the stuff. One thing that I, I, have to, I had to come to grips with over the years is that I have a, a partner, a silent partner in my real estate business, the United States government, all right? And that's something that you are not gonna get away from. You can't run from these people because they're going to get you. They're going to get you. You can't run away from them. So today I went and sat down with my accountant for about 45 minutes, asked her all the questions that you need to know being a real estate investor, a real estate entrepreneur, so you'll know what to do when you meet your accountant, what questions to ask, or when you sit down with a new accountant, what, what are you gonna ask them? Because you, you don't want an accountant that doesn't understand real estate doing your taxes. Going down, uh, if you're an investor, using a local tax preparer, or you even, God forbid, I hope you're not doing this, even doing your taxes yourself. Don't do that, all right? So let's go talk to my accountant for the next 45 minutes. The video will be, you won't be able to see too much video. I might put a picture of her up or something. But listen to what she's saying. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments below if, if you want me to ask her or email me and I will ask her also. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Please, class, subscribe to my channel. Like this content if it's something that you, that you find useful for your real estate career. And comment. Don't forget, give me your comments. It helps me. It's the wind to my flames, the fuel to my fire. All right, let's go see Chantel, see what she's got. Ready to do it? Sure. Thank you so much, Chantel. Hey, class, Chris Haskins here with the real estate roundup.com where we want to raise your financial literacy through real estate investing. In my quest to raise your financial literacy, I have here my certified public accountant, my CPA. How you doing, Chantel? Hey, I'm fine. Good to see you. Thanks. Let's get right into this, Chantel. <clears throat> you know what? I forgot to ask you about cars. I wanted to talk to you about cars owning versus leasing. Can we cover that too at the end? Sure. All right. So Chantel, tell me a little bit about you, your background, and how long you've been doing this tax thing. Well, um, I got my degree um, in 1998. Um, I've been in accounting for about four year, 14 years, and um, I guess, well, public accounting about 14 years. Okay. I, did, I was in private accounting for a couple years as well. All right. So, so private is you were mentioning. How does that work? Private is um, private accounting is working in a business in a company. So doing accounting for a specific business. Public accounting is is doing things for the public. So they would come into my office um, as a public accountant, prepare a tax return, do bookkeeping, do audits. I don't specifically <coughs> do audits, um, but public accounting firms are the ones that do the audits. Gotcha. Things like that. So cool. Okay. Now tell for my viewers, what is it that you do for me, Chantel? I know I see you all the time. We do all this paperwork and stuff. Mentally, when I show up, just tell me your mindset and when, I, when you're working with me. Well, when, when you show up, you're bringing me credit card statements, bank statements, um, purchase HUDs, sold or disclosure statements, I guess they're called now. Yeah, um, they changed the name. Right, sold um, disclosure statements so that all that information you give to me so that I can do your bookkeeping. Okay. And track your income and expenses, track your profits on your houses that you're selling. Um, rental properties. Rental properties. Correct. 
So that's what I, and then I take that. QuickBooks is what we use here in my office. Okay. Um, we put all the data in, get reports at the end of the year that I use to prepare your personal tax return. All right. So I heard you say bookkeeping and then you said tax returns. What are, are they different things or what is it? Well, your bookkeeping is basically tracking your income and your expenses, getting your profit or loss. All right. um, and so that has nothing to do with taxes. The bookkeeping is getting all the data. Is all getting all the 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 reports. So you have rental properties that we're tracking income and expenses, and we have to get the profit or the loss for each individual property. Your flip houses, I have to get the profit and the loss on each individual flip house because on your tax return, I have to report all the profit and losses on each property separately. Mm -hmm. Some of them are taxed a little bit different than others. Um, they go in different places. Your your training income goes in a different location and is taxed differently than your rental property income. Wow. So that falls all under bookkeeping. So, yes, if we can do the bookkeeping throughout the year on a relatively s a monthly schedule, quarterly schedule, then at the end of the year, it makes it easier. You're not having to remember things from the prior year, 12 oh, months Lord. before. So it's nice if you can do that on a monthly or a quarterly basis. Get questions answered if needed. Um, find out if there's a HUD missing or a disclosure statement missing on the sale of a property or a purchase of a property. Gotcha. Sounds a lot. I haven't even thought about all the stuff you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It can be daunting, no doubt. Mm hmm so let's talk about taxes. So, okay, you're doing bookkeeping for me and taxes. So some people you just would do tax return? Mm -hmm. Sure. Some people that have maybe one, two, or three rental properties, they, they track their own income and expenses, mm -hmm. and they bring me the um, annual income for the rental property and the expenses, the taxes, interest that is paid on their mortgage, okay. repairs. Gotcha. Um, Real estate taxes, supplies, mileage, if you're driving gotcha. to work on, you know, your property or check on it or whatever. And then I just load those in. Wow. So I don't have to do the bookkeeping for that. Man, okay. You just take the information that's given to me and I load it into the tax return. That'd be nice. Okay. So you're doing bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just never been able to do that stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Do you recommend that for certain people or, is it, or I guess for different size businesses? Sure. I mean, if you have just a few rental properties, then, you know, there's just a few transactions each month probably. Yeah. Um, you can track that in an Excel spreadsheet gotcha. or on a piece of paper. I mean, I have a client that has two rental properties and he has a notebook. Okay. A notebook per property. And nice. each year he brings me the two notebooks has everything written down in his notebooks, you know. That's cool. And I scan that in so I have record of it and, cool. okay. and we're done. But for those that have multiple monthly transactions, it, oh, it is time consuming. Yeah. So a lot of people don't want to mess with that and so they pay a CPA or a bookkeeping service to do that. Yeah, you do both. I'm thankful, Chantel. I, I just I just couldn't do it. You know, I'd rather just write the check. I know you got it straight. Everything's taken care of, down to the T, and it's done. <laughs> so, for my viewers or for our listeners today, what is a deduction, Chantel, and why do we care about them? Well, you have income, and you have deductions. So, your income is going to be um, your sales proceeds on a flip house or rental income okay. on a rental property or if people are paying you for training that's gotcha. your income All right. and you don't want to just report that because you're not being taxed on the income you're being taxed on profit okay. so you get to write off all the expenses associated with generating that income gotcha. um, so the expenses are deductions so expenses are deductions. all the expenses every penny that you pay toward an investment house, a rental property, um, on, a, on a business. There's some expenses on a business such as meals and entertainment that are, list, that are limited to 50%. Mm -hmm. but, um, but everything you spend is a deduction, some type of deduction. On the tax return, 
we have to split those deductions up between supplies, repairs, taxes, okay. mileage. Um, those are all deductions. But everything <clears throat> that you spend on on generating that income is a deduction. Gotcha. Is an expense. They're interchangeable. I heard you say write off because I hear commonly said people say write off. Is there a difference? A write off is a deduction. So let's just interchangeable. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So deduction, would a real estate investor want to maximize his deductions? Yes. I mean, everything that you're spending is going to be expensed, is going to be a deduction, is going to reduce that income that you got to okay. create your net profit, which you're taxed on that net profit. So you don't want to miss any deductions. Because if you miss a deduction, you're going to pay tax on a higher number than you would. So you're going to pay tax on a higher profit. And, and nobody wants to pay more taxes than they're le legally obligated to pay. So you don't want to miss any. And I know a lot of times if, if you're doing your own bookkeeping, things can get missed. If you have a bank statement and you're just trying to recapture from looking at a bank statement, oh you might miss some. And that's why we use software. A lot of people use it. It's probably the most widely used software. It's called QuickBooks. You put all the data in from your bank statement. You reconcile your bank statement so you don't miss anything. Yeah. Because you don't you don't want to miss any deductions. The IRS is going to get get your income because they get 1099s that are issued. The heads. You know, yeah. What's the you? If they. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, 1099s. Um, so they're going to they're going to see all your income. But they're not going to see your deductions. You're going to have to prove your deductions. That's why mm. you keep receipts. You keep bank statements, um, credit card statements, because that is the proof for all your deductions that yes. you would have to prove if you were to get examined. So the IRS doesn't care about you paying less. So basically, they're going to see what you made gross. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to you to prove what you spent. Yes. <laughs> okay. They're not going to question it if you don't put any deductions on your return. <laughs> But they will question if you put too many deductions. And yeah. You'll have to prove your deductions. Is there a, generally speaking, too many? Is that classified? Is too many, can it be quantified or is that something case by case? Well, it is case by, it is case by case. When you, when you register a business or on your Schedule C on a tax return, there is what's called, a, I think it's an NCIS code. Mm-hmm. Um, that basically tells the IRS what kind of business you are. And so it uses um, general, general, like generalized ratios, kind of. Mm -hmm. So if you have a CPA firm, your meals and entertainment is not going to be very big because we don't leave and go have lunch very often. You're, we're not entertaining yeah. clients generally. If you're a consulting firm, you're going to have a lot more meals and entertainment. So when they look at your meals and entertainment line item on your tax return, if it's way higher than what they say that ratio should be to your yeah. income, it's going to be a red flag. Gotcha. So so there are certain things that the IRS does that they they where they can red flag things if it if something looks too know. high for the type of business. I got you. So each the, business has a let's say a. a uh, threshold, perhaps, mm -hmm. if, so to speak. I see. Okay. And yeah. when you're, if you're outside of that threshold, then that's going to look not at not normal. It could trigger a red flag, and the IRS may say, "Hey, let's look at that," mm -hmm. and they'll send you. So, like sometimes on your personal tax return, you have a Schedule A, and you have your contributions. If your contributions are way higher than they've normally been, mm -hmm. um, or way higher than what they think could should be to the income that you have yeah it would it would send a red flag and they would send you a notice and say hey show us the proof for those contributions and you send them in so and these are contributions to a retirement account or mm -hmm. contributions like charitable contributions Char oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry yeah i kind of switched from business to individual as an example yeah. and they'll just say show us charitable. the support for that okay or on a business if something looks really high like auto expense um They'll, it will red flag it and they'll send you a notice that says we're not going to do a full examination but send us the proof to show your support for your deduction for auto expenses gotcha. really high 
And then, of course, they do have, if, the, if multiple things look questionable, then they'll do a full full examination. Oh, Lord, yes, yeah, I've been there. I don't know if we're going to get cover of that one on this training <laughs> here today. But the, yeah, I'm thinking about my church tithing. You're saying that's mm -hmm. out of whack, that we have, they have a threshold for what looks acceptable. Yes. Okay. I mean, if your income is 100000 and you're given 25000 that's going to be like, you, you may do that. But but it's not normal, so yeah, yeah. they would say, "Hey, that's a red flag." But if your if your income is you know five hundred thousand and you're given twenty thousand, that's not going to be a red flag. I see what you're saying. Wow, so. cool. And what is the most? Do you have like a, some most common deductions for real estate investors that you generally just talk about real quick? Um. Well, for rental properties. So let's or talk about for, flips. Yeah. We, well, yeah, flips. I mean, flips is just everything that you, sp I mean, it's everything you spend. Okay. So you're paying your contractors, mm -hmm. make sure you send 1099s. We need right? to get, we've got to cover 1099s. Right there. So, yes. So oh, the best okay. way to get your 1099 is to give your contractor before you pay them to fill out the W-9. What is a W-9? you got to explain this for people that don't know. So a W-9 is a form that you give to your contractors, contract labor, you give it to anybody that you're going to pay more than six hundred dollars. Anybody, period. Is it anybody, period? Anybody, period. All right. Make sure you get that. Yes. So that's that's a big thing, and it's kind of a pain, um, pain to do, and a lot of contractors don't want to fill it out. No, they don't. So you either, if you're strict about it, you say fill it out, or I'm not going to pay you. Yes. You know that's why a lot of times if you get it beforehand. <clears throat> Then, otherwise, if you're filling out your 1099s in January and you paid your contractor in the February before, oh, you're yeah. trying to track him down, you're trying to get him, it's difficult. That will be rough. So, wow. so 1099s, it's basically um, like if you go work for an em employer as an employee, you're going to fill out the W-4. Gotcha. Which says, you know, your name, your social, um tells them how much you want them to withhold but a 1099 is from businesses to businesses or individual to business if they don't have a business license mm -hmm. um, but basically it's getting the social security number address to know or EIN number if they're a business where to send the 1099 so we're going to send I'm, I'm not taking I don't take any taxes out when I pay people I pay Correct. contractors right so they're responsible for mm -hmm. their own taxes they are is that is that basically what the W nine is going to be for? It is to tell them that they are going to receive a ten ninety nine and they're going to be responsible for the taxes. They're on their own. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't want to class. I don't want to. Do, I don't want to have. What do they call it? Payroll. Payroll. Yeah, I don't want to deal with any payroll taxes. I don't have any employee. Right. I don't want to deal with it. Right. So a, a contractor should have a business license. Um, so it's you're hiring another business yeah. to work for you. Mm -hmm. They're not an employee. So we're tracking that. Well, Shanta, what I do is I put the check on a clipboard. I carry a clipboard. I put the W-9 on the paper, mm -hmm. and I attach the check right on there. It's kind of like a presentation, so I'm getting mm -hmm. it. Because sometimes they don't want to fill it out. Right. And is there something that we can do? Is there a form you can turn in if somebody gives you a fake one? I mean, or even... That's difficult. Um, there is an IRS verification site where you can go in and you can verify if they've given you the correct information. We're not going to do that on site. These people don't write on Right. They're not going to do that. Right. As long as you have the W-9, you send them the... You what know, you have. You, you have a copy of that. Yeah, I keep it. The IRS, if it's incorrect, will send you a notice. Gotcha. And let okay. you know okay. that it doesn't match their database. And you either get them to fill out a new one if you're s still working with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, or if they're long gone by then, then, you know, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Well, if you turned in what you got from the person, I mean, would the mm -hmm. IRS be forgiving for that maybe? They wouldn't penalize you. Gotcha. They find them, no doubt, eventually. They would, yeah. Normally, yeah, it's a typo or something yeah. like that. Gotcha. You know? Well, I mean, you never know who's dealing with these contracts. In my experience, you just don't know. Yeah. People showing up to do stuff. They got EIN numbers, and I can't verify it on site. So. Right. I haven't had it happen, but I'm just curious. I know another common thing that some rental property owners think is, you know, they think they can take their whole mortgage payment as a deduction. Okay. And, you know... When you say whole mortgage payment, what do you mean by like, a whole mortgage payment? Like the interest and the principal. Interest and principal. Right. Gotcha. 
Um, but in reality, you can only take the interest portion yeah. of your mortgage payment. You can take the real estate taxes, the insurance. A lot of times that's all in your mortgage, right? Um, but your principal payment is going to reduce the loan. Yeah. So that's not an expense on... Or it's not a deduction on the on the rental property. Not a deduction. Now, when you say they can take, when you say we, we use that word take loosely, when you say take it, what do you mean by taking it as an expense? It means you can put it on your, you can offset your profit with it. Okay, so, so rent is 1000 mortgage mm-hmm. payment is 800 Go ahead. Um, interest of that is 400 so you can yes. only only put the 400 on the interest expense line. So on we're, your tax return. we're using that as a deduction. Mm-hmm. As mm-hmm. a deduction, correct. So... And then, and then, <clears throat> even though you can't take the principal uh, portion of the payment, um, you know, we could get we could get into more details. But it's reducing your loan. So when you sell the property, you get more cash because you've made your loan um, reduced. But the cash you receive, you're not taxed on. You're taxed on the profit of the property. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So just because you receive gotcha. a lot of cash doesn't mean that if you receive a hundred thousand in cash, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be taxed on a hundred thousand. You could be taxed on sixty, gotcha. or you could be taxed on one hundred eighty. Wow. So. Hmm. Anyway, that's. Does that fall like, into depreciation recapture? Are we there too yet? Yeah, and and so. You, we so get to depreciation. Yeah, first. we can get to depreciation. <laughs> so the depreciation is so is is like a, a paper transaction, right? A paper. Because you don't actually pay out deductions um, that we've been talking about is money actually paid out okay. to somebody, right, Arm. for something. Um, but depreciation is um, the cost of the house gotcha. divided over 27 and a half years, and you get to take 27 and a half um, percent, uh, one, one, one 27 and a half, whatever you call it, yeah. um, a year. As an expense, yes, one, yes, one twenty seventh, one twenty seventh and a half, right? Um, as an expense, okay. So you're you're depreciating the property, which is a whole nother subject because property should appreciate, not depreciate. Yes, and that comes into the depreciation recapture oh, that you want to talk about. But so the depreciation is a portion of the actual. Purchase of the home yeah. gets to be taken a little bit each year. Let's make it easy though. So, Let's say the house we bought it for twenty seven thousand. I want to make it simple. You get a thousand a year as okay. a deduction. So I bought it, but I I got caught up the dirt in the house. Or tell me about. I don't know how that works. Right. So when we put a home, a rental home, on the depreciation schedule, we divide it up between the building and the land. Because okay. the bu- the building is depreciated. So as the building ages, supposedly, it gets older, it's worth less. So when you sell it, it's depreciated down. Da- its value has depreciated down mm-hmm. because it's getting older. Gotcha. Um, and so the thought is that you would sell it for less in the future. The land doesn't age. Mm-hmm. So you don't depreciate it. Okay. The IRS rules. So we can't do anything with the iris. So you can separate out the land value and the, and the house value, and most insurances do that. Your tax assessment does that. Yeah. Typically, um, if it's if if it's you know a, a normal size property in a house, you know it's 80, 20, 75, okay. 25, something like that. If it's a huge piece of land and a tiny little house, then obviously you're going to use more for land and. You know, so you look at that when you set it up because the land is not depreciated. Land, you can't depreciate land, class. You hear that? Don't be out there trying to depreciate right. dirt like I tried to do years ago. Right. So so I think the most common thing that I get um, when people come to me after preparing their own tax returns and realizing that they don't want to do that anymore or if they haven't done it correctly, one of the most common mistakes that I get is not depreciating rental properties correctly. Correctly, yeah. How the hell do they know? They're going to read an article or read the tax code right. and do it on their own. Right. And so there's other things, too. So you don't just depreciate the house, the, the purchase price. You depreciate or amortize, amortize the loan costs, oh, the wow. closing costs, or the settlement charges. Okay. You're not supposed to write those off in one year. They're supposed to be amortized. Wow. And it's 
Amortized is a different word because it's intangible. It's not like you can go touch closing costs mm -hmm. or you can go touch your house. Wow. But if you buy a new HVAC system, that gets depreciated gotcha. over a certain amount of years, okay. not 27, most likely 7. Gotcha. Um, or if you, if you put a new carpet or a new appliance, wow. those things have to be considered to be depreciated. Is there a rule of thumb that you like to say, Chantel, that will be what will be depreciated and what is taken in the first year? Oh, um, yeah, that year? I mean, if it's something that is going <coughs> to substantially improve the property, it's depreciated. Okay. If you're changing door, you know, door doorknobs and light switches and painting, that's repairs, maintenance, gotcha. maintenance and repairs. Small plumbing stuff. If you're putting a whole new plumbing system in. You know, and it's six thousand dollars. You're gonna, you're gonna depreciate that. Luckily, I haven't had one of those yet. Wow, I'm talking about small section eight mm -hmm. inspection stuff, a faucet or a mm -hmm. leaky sink or something, or a toilet. Right, that's all repairs. Yes. You would just expense that in the year that you make the payment. So the problem I run into is I'm buying houses for a steep discount. You know, they might be worth, let's just say, a hundred. I might be mm -hmm. buying them for thirty. Mm -hmm. You know, I just it's hard for me to understand why. How do we, well, then you tell me, you're the expert. How do we, can I appreciate it based on the value of the fair market value or do I appreciate it based on? Purchase price. That's the same right. Right. But that's actually probably good for you if you think about it because when you sell it at fair market value later on, mm -hmm. You would have to recoup all that extra depreciation anyway. Oh, wow. I'm appreciating for right. the market value. Oh, mm -hmm. That would be big. So it's better just do it now. to just just take the little bit if, you, if, if your house is going to appreciate. Because that's the thing you talked about, depreciation recapture. Here along the way, if you're depreciating this house, so basically you, you have, when you sell it, you have sales proceeds, sales price minus net book value. Okay. So net book value is purchase price minus accumulated depreciation over all the years, you get your net book value. That's your tax value. Gotcha. Okay. So if you sell it for more than that tax net book value, you're going to be paying tax on the difference. Yeah. Okay. And all that depreciation that's reduced your net book value, you're mm -hmm. going to be recouping that. You shouldn't have taken it. The IRS makes you take it. If you if you sell a house and you didn't take the depreciation, then you get audited. The IRS is going to recalculate your gain on that sale, and they're going to add depreciation oh, over okay. however many years, whether you took the expense or not. Gotcha. So you need to take the depreciation expense. Mm -hmm. You just have to factor that in. If you're going to sell the house for more than what the net book value is, you have to recapture that depreciation. Gotcha. I heard you, this wasn't on my paper here, you talked about basis before when I buy mm -hmm. property. Basis. Basis is the purchase price of, of what you have in your property. So it's the purchase price of the property, any improvements that we've capitalized, okay. any appliances that we've capitalized. So that's your beginning basis and that's the amount that's going to be depreciated and then you have your depreciation and you have your adjusted basis okay. is basically your net book value net book value mm -hmm. so that's the depreciation recapture falls into all of that yes gotcha so much to understand yes being an entrepreneur the problem is we have to just know a little bit about so much that's why you that's why you have a cpa <laughs> to handle all the the tax complications from very it very true very true that gets into my, quick, my next question. Why do we need a CPA, Chantel? I, well, <coughs> just so. in this little interview, we've talked about some of the complications of, of tax law and IRS rules, and that's just, I mean, literally the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, I can't, there's so much out there that, you know, we have to have 40 hours of CPA minimum, I mean, CPE, Continuing Professional Education, every year to stay up to date. Wow. Hmm. And, and that's normally in a niche. So public accountants have to know tax, bookkeeping, payroll. Um, if you do audits, that's a whole, whole oh, nother yeah. world in public accounting. Um, 
trust to state individual business taxes it's a lot of information out there um and so you know we're required to have training which is good um and then on top of that you have tax law changes Mm. so the new you know january 1st 2018 the new tax laws and it was a huge overhaul yeah um a lot of big changes wow that that you know, some some changes may make it easier, simpler for individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, the standard deduction is now doubling. So you may not have to itemize anymore. But anybody that has a business, um, it doesn't change anything in terms of simplifying anything. Yeah. In fact, now we have the net business um, income, that. which is, which is um, a huge deduction for small business owners. 20% deduction of pass-through income, Schedule C income, um, partnerships, LLC, um, subchapter S. Um, so it's 20% of your profit would be basically tax-free. The first 20%? Or you know, when you say 20%, I'm So saying, if, you, if you have $100,000 of business okay, income that's going to pass through and be taxed on your personal tax return... Twenty thousand dollars is going to be tax gotcha. free. Gotcha. You will be taxed on eighty. Nice. So it's huge. That is big. Um, you know, and and so I think having a, a tax preparer, a CP, a CPA. Um, there's lots of tax preparers out there that are not CPAs, and there's probably some really good ones. Yeah. Um, an enrolled agent, which I am as well. That's basically the IRS's certification that allows you to practice before the IRS. Gotcha. Um, so I think that. You know, if you have a business, if you're having a lot of transactions, you know, you you call me or email me, I don't know, every month, every other month, something yeah. with a business question. Yeah. What do I do? Should I lease this car or should I buy it? You yeah, know? we'll get to that. So that's, you know. Well, I, I just don't want to have nothing to come back on me because I want to be able to make sure I trust right. the experts. Right. <laughs> so that's part of, you know, you pay me to prepare your tax return. You pay me to do your bookkeeping. When I set up my tax preparation fees, part of that includes you being able to call me and ask a question or gotcha. email me and ask a question. Cool. Um, you know, if you have something totally different that you're going to start a new venture, um, and you I have, do the Airbnb. Then. <laughs> you know, that may be that may be separate, but oh, know, okay. You know, but you feel free. You can ask me questions. You can make sure you don't make a wrong decision. You know, or yeah. At least I can give you the information so that you can make a more informed decision. Thank you. Yeah. That's my hope. I'm done with the internet. Yeah, I don't trust the internet so, on my tax stuff. There's a lot of information on the internet. Yeah, I would prefer to give you a call. So yeah, I'm done. So I, you know, I like to think that people value my service, yeah. and I think I, I think, think some of most I think most of my clients do. I most of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm.